everybody. This is Bob, and uh, welcome to the show, the Global Dispatch Radio Network. Now, it's been about a year and a half since Donald Trump took the White House, and a lot has happened policy-wise. You may be surprised to hear that, because if you're paying attention to cable news, you would never know there's a lot of policy uh, being taken care of here. So put aside the tweets and, and all the drama a lot of it Trump-induced, uh, put aside the hysterics of Rachel Maddow and Chris Matthews, put away the love fest of Sean Hannity and the right-wing media. I want to take a look at Trump policies from a, quote, not on a team, close quote, lens. So here it is, Trump, the good the bad, and the ugly. And this list is not all-inclusive, so if I missed some stuff, sorry about that. Let's go ahead and start with the good. And I have to say there was much more policy moves in this section that I would have ever expected a year and a half ago. So I was pleasantly surprised. And let's start with the obvious, packing the courts. Neil Gorsuch was a grand slam, and that was proven through the uh, cases last week. And Trump filling lower appellate courts with strict constructionists instead of the broad interpretations of those that believe in the living constitution and those that want to legislate for the bench. It's been fantastic. And he's got another pick coming up, and I suggest it will probably be a very good one. Regulations. He's also been pretty spectacular on repealing and rolling back regulations for reducing the unnecessary regulatory burdens on the American people. Well, he, the Trump administration withdrew or delayed about 1,600 Obama rules that were in the pipeline but have not been finalized yet. So that's, that's a definite positive. And he also killed many other regulations Dozens, hundreds, don't know what the exact number is, but quite a few. Tax cuts, clearly this was a huge benefit for the American people and U.S. businesses, and ultimately the economy and freedom. Uh, Now dropping the business tax to about 20% is huge. Cutting the corporate tax rate creates the right incentives. It encourages businesses to come back to the United States and stay here. It reduces incentives for tax evasion. In the long run, the benefits of these policies reach middle and lower classes through higher wages, increased employment, which we are seeing, and better products. And and think about it. Why on earth you would never see companies like Apple bring back $250 billion into this country if not for these tax cuts? Why would they? Why would they want the U.S. government taking 35% of uh, this money and squandering it? Why? Why would anybody? Um, Trump's framework offers more direct benefits to the middle class, too. It doubles the standard deduction and promises to increase the child tax credit. Now, two issues I have with the tax cuts is I believe they should have been much deeper. And most disappointingly, Uh, There's no spending cuts, and and that's just horrible. We cannot continue to go on like this. We cannot keep on spending like drunken sailors. It's just not feasible, and it's not going to last. So we got to get a grip on this. And you would think Trump might be the guy to do that, but apparently not. Now, as far as health care, you know, I, I really can't. Well, maybe you can, but I can't really blame Trump for not repealing the disastrous ACA. He didn't have the Republicans. You know, we want to thank the big government Republicans who only oppose the stuff when they're out of power. Um, However, there was one bright spot, and that was the Department of Labor's finalization of of its rule, expanding access to association health plans, or AHPs. Now, these expand the types of groups that can form an AHP. It allows for membership across state lines. It would also allow self-employed individuals who have no other employees to take part in a large group AHP with their families, including a self-insured AHP. The rule would continue to ensure Americans are not denied coverage or charge higher rates due to pre-existing conditions. 
And the new policy would help create more options for the 15 million Americans and their family members who do not have insurance because they work for a small employer that does not offer coverage or run a sole proprietorship. As well as the 9 million Americans who purchase unaffordable coverage in the individual market without qualifying for a subsidy. Now, according to the CBO estimates, about 4 million people, 4 million more Americans will be covered by AHPs by 2023. So, yeah, that that, that goes on the good side. And uh, that's highly appreciated. Uh, real Some real free market activity going on there. Uh, religious liberty and abortion. Uh, and, and there's th- the list is rather long for this, but uh, let me just uh, touch it on a little bit. Uh, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, you never know what you're going to get with Trump, but uh, he has been very good on issues involving religious liberty and abortion. Trump has made it very clear that religious freedom is a priority throughout his administration. This includes last May when he signed an executive order to greatly enhance religious freedom and freedom of speech. Uh, taking action to ensure that religious institutions may freely exercise their First Amendment right to support and advocate for candidates and causes in line with their values. And also like ensuring that religious Americans and their organizations, for example, the Little Sisters of the Poor, are not forced to choose between violating their religious beliefs by complying with Obamacare's contraceptive mandate or shutting their doors. Uh, Now, President Trump also quickly reinstated and expanded the Mexico City policy, which prevents $9 billion in foreign aid from from being used to fund the global abortion industry and its advocates. So, yeah, that's a good thing. The UN Human Rights Council. Now, pulling out of the UN Human Rights Council was a fantastic move. The council has little to do with human rights, and just look at its brutal members the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where they're finding mass graves all over the place, Syria, Venezuela. I mean, these are brutal places. And it has a whole lot more to do with bashing Israel. More agenda moments are about Israel than every other country combined, basically. So the numbers are really there to justify it. And, And essentially, the U.S. honestly has... Not a whole lot of need for the UN in general. Um, Now, pulling out of the Paris Climate Treaty, uh, while advocates for the Paris Climate Treaty would give such weak reasons why we shouldn't pull out, like we're a leader in climate action or, you know, calling it climate change a issue of national security, the true impact is that it threatens to inflict energy poverty on developing nations. It gives foreign bureaucrats control over U.S. energy policy. And the worst thing of all, the most ridiculous thing of all, there are no measurable climate or environmental benefits. None. So, yeah. So those are the things that I put in the category for good Trump. Then I I touched on a couple things that were kind of in between the good and the bad. Could have been put in either way, but uh, I call them okay. And those are North Korea and ISIS. Not totally good, but not totally bad. Now, concerning North Korea, talking is always better than bombing. I've always subscribed to this. So I'm very happy that Trump is talking to the Kim regime. However, I won't give him that much credit, like some on the right are, I mean, like Sean Hannity and the like, like saying he deserves a Nobel Prize, because I believe President Trump's belligerence early on put us in this position to it came to a point that you should either talk or go to war. So this had to be resolved. Uh, But I am glad we are talking. Let's talk with other countries too that we're not friendly with, like Iran, if they want to. And the other issue is ISIS. Um, Good. Trump has essentially destroyed ISIS in the Middle East, and that, of course, is a good thing. However, how how are these things being done? Um, My problem is that we should always have congressional approval whenever we use military force. And, of course, this was not the case. 
Now to the bad. <clears throat> well, a lot of people may disagree with me, but bombing Syria was categorized as bad Trump. Why? Because there's no evidence that Syria used chemical weapons. And we never had a chance to prove it. They talked to General Mattis, you know, right after the the second time that it was used, supposedly. And Mattis said, well, we're getting ready to send people in to do an investigation. Then the next minute you know, the place is being bombed the smithereens. So we don't know. We have no evidence of the first time in 2017 or this year. And the other thing you have to look at is, I always look at topics of motivation. And what was Assad's motivation? Really, I mean, seriously. The only time we really pay any attention to him is when we think he's using chemical weapons. Otherwise, we leave him alone. So why does he want the world's attention? Chemical weapons is a big thing, and it does garner the ire of the world. So why would Assad want that? I don't understand the motivation. And again, going back to the congressional approval thing, you shouldn't be flinging missiles into another country without congressional approval, period. The only time the president should be doing anything like that is if we're, we are in you know, grave or imminent danger or being attacked. And that's not the case. And the, the ironic thing about all this is, as much as the MSNBC, CNN crowd despise just about everything Trump does, and a lot of it for good reason, some of it not good, um, but a lot of them gave Trump a lot of positive marks for flinging missiles into Syria. That really tells you a lot about the peace-loving uh, Democrats and left-wing uh, politicians and media. Okay, and let me go to the last section, which I'm going to call the ugly. And these are the things that are, uh, in my view, clearly the worst things of Trump. And let's start with immigration. This was both ugly for policy and for optics. I mean, could the optics be any worse? But this talk today is about policy. And no matter what Sarah Sanders says, no law requires immigrant children to be separated from their parents. Um, then there was a quote from DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, who said, quote, if you as a parent break into a house, you will be incarcerated by police and thereby separated from your family. We're doing the same thing at the border. Nay, nay, Secretary Nielsen. It's not the same. Burglary is a serious crime and it's basically a felony. Illegal entry is not. Illegal entry is a misdemeanor offense. Illegal entry is most similar to technical violations of motor vehicle law, like driving without a license, not breaking and entering. So, poor optics, poor policy by the Trump administration, and Trump felt it and he made the move. So, I'll give him, I'll give him props for that. He did make a move to change that. How well they're doing is, depends who you listen to. If you listen to MSNBC, they're doing a horrible job. If you listen to Fox, they're doing a glorious job. So don't know the truth on that. Um, tariffs. Ugly, ugly, ugly. If Trump wants to ruin any ec economic progress the country has made, tariffs is the prescription for that. Um, restrictions on trade like tariffs make a country poorer. Let's take a look at one economist. A guy named Adam Smith about 250 years ago, what he had to say, if a foreign country can supply us with, com with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy it of them with some part of the produce of our own industry employed in a way in which we have some advantage. And also you got to look at it as two wrongs don't make a right. And Smith goes on to, to talk about that theory Quote, when there is no probability that any such repeal of a tariff in a foreign country can be procured, it seems a bad method of compensating the injury done to certain classes of our people to do another injury ourselves, not only to those classes, but to almost all the other classes of them. When our neighbors prohibit some manufacturer of ours, we generally prohibit 
not only the same, for that alone would seldom affect them considerably, but some other manufacturer of theirs. This may no doubt give encouragement to some particular class of workmen among ourselves, like steel workers, for example, and by excluding some of their rivals may enable them to raise their price in the home market. Those workmen, however, who suffered by our neighbor's prohibition will not be benefited by ours. On the contrary, they and almost all the other classes of our citizens will thereby be obliged to pay dearer than before for certain goods. Every time you go to Walmart, things are going to cost a little bit more. That's what it says. For every such law, therefore, imposes a real tax upon the whole country. Not in favor of that particular class of workmen who were injured by our neighbor's prohibition, but of some other class. Yeah, this is perhaps the worst thing that Trump is doing economically, and I really wish he would uh, turn tail on this uh, theory. But a lot of people believe in it. They really believe it. Those are the workmen in particular, particular industries that Adam Smith talks about. Okay, let's move on to the other ugly things. And uh, the omnibus bill. This was an absolute fiscal embarrassment and Trump signed it. This will, of course, lead to a much larger deficit than originally projected. According to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, red ink for 2018 will reach $800 billion. That's a solid $230 billion higher than what was projected by the Congressional Budget Office in June 2013 in their 10-year forecast. And that's a whole $2 trillion in additional debt after just one year of Republican control of the legislative and executive branches. Bad, bad, bad. Now, Trump said he'll never do that again, and I uh, hope that he does stick by that. And lastly, um, John Bolton. While he has many flaws with foreign policy, I have to give a hat tip to Trump. I believe he's been much less aggressive in foreign policy than either Bush or Obama. So why on earth would you appoint warmonger John Bolton? This could be very bad for the U.S. to have Bolton have Trump's ear. And lastly, I just want to say things that I'm disturbed that he's not discussing or taken seriously. And of course, that would be entitlements. No politician does, but Trump is different. I would love to see him take on entitlements. The Fed, I would love to see Trump take on the Fed. And there's a farm bill going to be crossing his desk reasonably soon, which is nothing more than a giant welfare program. I hope that Trump does not sign that, but we will take a look. Anyway, not all inclusive, but that was my good, bad, and ugly of the Donald Trump administration for the first year and a half. Thanks, and uh, if you want to read more, check out theglobaldispatch.com for all kinds of news and views. Again, that's theglobaldispatch.com.